So there's a lot of material that I want to get through uh, within the next few weeks. So what I thought I would do is make this video where I'm going to cover everything that's on my mind just lightly, but we'll see how much detail we get into. No one has seen God at any time, full stop. John 4 verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. There you go, that's it, done. No one has seen God at any time, okay? No one has seen God at any time. End of debate, okay? First Corinthians 8, 6, for, under, for us there is one God and there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. Look at Acts 2, 36. God made Jesus Christ both Lord and Messiah. So if God made Jesus Christ Lord and we have one God and one Lord and that one God made the one Lord, who is our God? The Father. John 20, 17, where again it's reinforced, the Father is your God. Okay, Jesus says, my God, Jesus says, my Father, he is your God. That's what Jesus Christ said. Those are the words that came out of his mouth, those words that will never pass away. If you want a defense on Judgment Day, this is what you say. Jesus, John 20, 17, I believed you. Okay, I mean, obviously there's more to your judgment than that, but in terms of following the truth and obeying Christ, there you go. Okay, and again, it's not sorcery, it's just believing him. Right, then you've got John 20, 27. As I say, Thomas felt Christ, everybody saw him, but he's not God. Hence, no one has seen God at any time after, and this is them saying that after the resurrection, okay? And then I wanted to make some points too about images, okay? That's why I brought up uh, uh, Colossians 1.15. Look at what it says here, okay? Colossians 1.15. Look what it says about the image, okay? He is the image of, not the, not the, uh, the, the, um, the original um, article, no, he's the image of, okay? And look at Genesis 1.27. Adam was made an image of, okay? So Adam had that, that connection, that relationship, that image of, okay? The express image, right? Until he sinned, disobedience, you know? But then first Corinth, first uh, Colossians 1 15, the image of. And then you go to Romans 8 29. And you see in Romans 8 29 that this is the image we're all being conformed to. It's the same image. So if Jesus Christ is in the image of the invisible God, right, and we're being conformed into the image of the invisible God, then that means me and Christ will be in the same image of the invisible God. Big brother, Lord, you understand? It's just, it's just a logic that's been kept away from people because I've not seen it. And it's, it's something people need to get it straight. Absolutely is. Okay, so the next point of interest was the whole John 5, 22 to 24, where it speaks about all judgment uh, being given over and a lot of people say ah see there you go Jesus is God because all judgment has been given over to him and I'm thinking to myself that's a very strange thing to say it's a very strange thing to say why would I say that's very strange why would I say that's very strange because don't you know that you will judge angels you see we are co-heirs with Christ people forget that Jesus Christ the heir of God we co-heirs with Christ seated beside Christ okay I will share my throne with him what does that make us high priests you know we're we are in a sense judges judgment has been committed to the 12 disciples right they're gonna judge the 12 tribes okay I know you're saying that's not all judgment but what I'm saying is there's a there's a there's a giving over of judgment okay God gave that judgment to his son but I'll move on that's off the point okay so Jesus says in John 8 50 there is one who seeks and judges. There is one. Does, is Jesus saying that's me? No, but he's saying the Father and I are one. Okay, the Father and I are one. Okay? And don't get lost don't get lost in that, okay? Because if you look to John 17 in that prayer, okay, I pray, oh Father, that they'll be one with us, you know, you and me, I and them. On that day you will know that I am in my Father. You know, John 14 that is. 
I am in my Father, they are in me, I and you. You know, there's this oneness between all of us and the one spirit. There's one spirit and we're all in it. All right? That's the thing. That's the thing people forget. Jesus does not seek his own glory. So I've established that Jesus isn't seeking his own glory. Okay? So Jesus isn't uh, the God who judges. All right? There's only one God. Jesus Christ seeks the glory of that only one God. How can you believe who seek honour from one another and not the honour that comes from the only God? Jesus Christ tells us he does not, he does not honour himself. And then he goes on to tell us that the honour he has, he gets from the Father. So who's the only God? Who's the, who, it's the Father. Because the, the honour who comes from the only God, Jesus Christ does not honour himself, but yet the Father honours him. You understand? If Jesus Christ honoured himself and said, why do you not seek the glory that comes from the only God? And he honoured himself, you'd be like, oh, he must be the only God. But Jesus Christ never honoured himself. But he had the honour from the only God. Hence, John 17, 3. I just forget how it starts. I praise thee, O Father, is coming to my mind. And this is eternal life, that they may know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Whom you have sent. Who's the you? The only true God, who you have sent. And the honour from the only God, okay? If I honour myself, my honour is worthless, but my Father honours me, yeah? Okay. So Jesus never once affirmed himself as God. Jesus constantly denied himself, okay? Constantly denied himself, okay? So, does it make sense to say, oh, he denied himself in every way, but he, 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 took, he made a point of affirming the fact he was God? No, that's not denying yourself. That's glorifying yourself. I am God, okay? He's not doing that, okay? It's an absolutely ridiculous thing to say. It's bizarre. Okay, because Jesus never sought the, the honour that comes from men. How can you believe who seek honour from one another? He wasn't looking for the honour of men, okay? He has it now. Why? Because God is glorified in him. But he never sought it from other people. He sought it from the only God. So for him to come out and say, oh, I am God, worship me. No. Okay, people like to say, ah, but they, they fell at his feet, didn't they? People worship to Jesus and people only worship God. So I'm thinking to myself, King David. And I'm thinking to myself, I do not honour myself. So when people fell down and worshipped Jesus at his feet, they were worshipping the king, rightly so. Rightly so. They weren't worshipping God and Jesus wasn't looking for that honour from, honor from men. You know? Anyways, if you look to Hebrews 2.9, what does it say in Hebrews 2.9? It says that Jesus was crowned with honour and glory. From whom? It doesn't say the Father of the Trinity, the tri God. Jesus was crowned with honour from God. Right. So if you look at John 5.44, okay, he seeks the honour that comes from the only God. Okay, now, and then if you look at John seven eighteen, he's he who seeks his own uh, glory, he who seeks his own honor, worthless. But he who seeks the, the the honor that comes from the one who sent him, he is true, and righteousness and righteousness is in him. Okay, so he's true and righteous. Why is Jesus true and righteous? He's just told us because he seeks the glory that comes from the one who sent him. Who sent him? the only true God, the only God whose honour he sought, okay? Now, as I say, people like to bring up the, the whole point of, ah, but it says you have to honour the Son as you honour the Father. Listen, honouring the Son as you honour the Father doesn't make the Son the Father. It doesn't make him God, okay? If I say to you, and I thank David, Mc, David McMurdo for bringing this to my mind, he says, David made the point, if I say, Honour my wife as you would honour me. Do you, are you taken aback? Are you like, oh my goodness, William is his wife? Oh, I see it now. The, 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 aye, William must be his... Uh, no. If I say honour my wife as you honour me, I'm telling you just what I say. You know, to honour, to show her that honour. Okay, because I'm glorified in her. Okay, 
She glorifies me, I'm glorified in her. Okay, she is my wife. Okay, so if you disrespect my wife, you disrespect me. I understand. If you, if you disrespect God's Messiah, you disrespect God. Okay? And it shall come to pass that whoever does not hear the words which issue forth from his mouth, I will demand it of him. Okay? Deuteronomy 18, that whole prophecy. I'll raise up a prophet from among your brethren and put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak all that I command him. All right? And understand this, no one ever honoured the Son as the Father before. Okay, why was that? Because there was no Son to honour. Okay, there was no Son to honour. Jesus Christ tells us who the God of the disciples are. It's Jesus says, my Father, whom you call your God. Right? He's, he's telling us who the God of the the Hebrews is the God of the Israelites and he even he even says the Shema you know he tells them the Shema Yahweh your Elohim Yahweh is one or Yehovah is one okay and then the the scribe is like you've spoken well teacher Jesus didn't okay, didn't Jesus wasn't being coy he wasn't being like by the way I'm I'm that God no that wasn't going on okay it wasn't going on right he said that he said the Shema to the satisfaction of the Israelites, and they all agreed. Christ Himself never uttered a word against it. Why? Because he was an old he was a Jew under the Old Testament, the old uh, the Tanakh, you know, the Law and the Prophets, the Law. Okay, so the Son was never honoured as the Father before. Malachi two ten. Have we not all one God? Have we not all one Father? You know, it's not one Father, one God created us. You know what I'm saying? Because as I say, there was no Son to honour before this point. Okay. But the Messiah promised to come, uh, well, the Messiah was promised to come before before Abraham, okay? So he had that preeminence and foreknowledge in God's mind, you know? He was in the bosom of the Father from the foundation of the world, from before the foundation of the world, okay? Um, and you, you, you can see that in 1 Peter 1, 20 to 25, okay? And uh, ultimately, he's the king of the said kingdom, God's Messiah, and at the end of the age, Jesus Christ will uh, step down from that position of authority there and give the kingdom over to God again. That's what it says. It doesn't say God the Father. It says God. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. So that God may be all in all. Jesus Christ subject to God. We subject to God as co-heirs. Psalm 89. Okay, have a wee look at Psalm 89, verse 27 there. Okay. We have God telling us that he's going to bring about this this king. Okay, he's going to be king of the world. Okay, he'll be the first he'll be my firstborn, okay, king of the world. God doesn't say that about himself. God is king of the world. Okay, God is the the most high God. Everything belongs to him, right? So the one who's going to become king, he's not talking about himself in any form. Okay. He's talking about the Messiah who will be raised up from among the brethren of the Israelites and I'll, I'll just re-emphasize that we're co-heirs and then Romans 1 3 to 4 he's declared to be the son of God okay how why by the resurrection from the dead okay the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead okay he died he's made alive in the spirit and as one spirit is one with God then we're called to walk in that same spirit and be one with God and again, if you look back to Acts, where it says, Today I have begotten you. Okay, we're told in Acts that's what that means, begotten from the dead, right? And then in 1 John it tells us, You are sons of God, from God. That's what it says in 1 John. He says, You are from God. You are sons of God. You, listening to this, if you're obeying Christ in the Spirit, you are a son of God. Okay? And you are from God. Okay, look at John, look at John 16, sorry, John 17, 16. Jesus says, I am not from the world, just as these are not from the world. Or is it, these are not from the world, just as I am not from the world. You understand? Jesus Christ is the firstborn of many brethren, okay? As I say, made alive in the spirit. This is our hope, all right? And then, 
I want people to understand that because Jesus Christ is one with God in the Spirit, it tells us in the Scriptures, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Okay, and it continues on to the next verse. The Lord is the Spirit. Right? Now you might think to yourself, well, I don't understand. Well, if you look at John 16, 13, it tells you that the Holy, the Spirit of Truth, Jesus Christ will send the Spirit of Truth and he will tell you things soon to come. Go to Revelations 1.1. 1, 1. What does it tell you? This is, the, this is the revelation of God given to Jesus Christ so that he can tell his servants things that are soon to come. You understand? You see what's going on here? The other that was being sent was the resurrected Christ, the heavenly man, 1 Corinthians 15. There is a natural man and there is a heavenly man, but the natural comes first. And then the heavenly man, the what? The new creation, the new man, the other man, the new creature, the resurrected Christ. And if that point didn't stress it enough, John 16, 13 and Revelation 1, 1, look, look what Jesus Christ says to the churches. To the church of, okay, set this, these are the words of the Son of God, the one with eyes like fire and, and the flesh, the, leg, you know, the arms like fine brass, right? And then what does it say at the end of every message? Let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Who spoke? Jesus Christ in every situation was speaking. And what does he end it with? Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay? Jesus Christ made alive in the Spirit. Jesus Christ became a life-giving Spirit. If the Spirit of God is in you, if the Spirit of Christ is in you. Okay? You'll see that in Romans, is it 8, 23? Romans 8, anyway. Romans 8, verses 11 to 12. If the Spirit of Christ is in you, if the Spirit of God is in you, if you are in the Spirit, understand it, let it challenge you, let it change you. So we look now at Isaiah 42, 8. My glory I will not give to another. Now people read that and they think, well, God said he won't give his glory to another. And God glorified himself in Christ, so Christ must be God. But that's not what this passage is saying. Let me quickly debunk that. John 17, 22. In this passage, we see that we have the glory of God. Okay, now let's just <clears throat> flesh that out so you fully understand it. You're going to want to look at Galatians 3. But before we get to there, let's look at uh, Isaiah 42, 6. Two verses back. I, Yahweh, or Jehovah, or Yahweh, have called you in righteousness. I will give you as a light to the Gentiles. Okay, so we see here, God is saying to the Messiah, my glory I will not give to another. Okay? Now what can we discern from this? Let me just re-emphasize the, the Messianic prophecy. 42.1 Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. This, the speaker God, is speaking about someone else, isn't he? I'll put my spirit upon him. Spirit of God upon him. Okay? God is spirit. Jesus Christ walked in that spirit. Full of the spirit. The fullness was pleased to dwell. The Father dwelt inside Christ. We understand that, yes? Here's the thing. This promise was made to the elect. My glory I will not give to another. Yes, God will not give his glory to another, save his elect. Now he's, he's speaking to Christ here, isn't he? The promise was made to whom? Abraham and Abraham's seed. The seed, not seeds, seed one, Christ. So then, we're all doomed? No. We are in Christ. We are heirs of the promise, Galatians 3. Heirs of the promise. My glory I will not give to another. Understand what he's saying there. I will not give my glory to another. That means he is giving his glory to someone. And even the Messiah says, Father, glorify your name. And what does the Father say? I, will gl I have glorified my name and I will glorify it again. Okay, God is glorifying his name in Christ. And then we are told to magnify God, glorify God in us. Understand? We are heirs of the promise. We are Abraham's seed in Christ. Okay? 
So any glory that we that's been given unto Christ is given to us. As I say, John seventeen twenty two, the glory which you have given me, I have given them. So when you read John seventeen twenty two through the passage in Galatians three, it all makes beautiful sense, doesn't it? Absolutely, it does. Absolutely, and I just want you to look at Acts three thirteen. Understand, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers raised up his servant Jesus and glorified him. Glorified his, Je his servant Jesus Christ. Okay? And then also in 1 Peter 1, 21, we see the glory that's been given to Christ in this passage as well. Okay? Now we should understand and know that we, in Christ, have been known to God before the foundation of the world. We were called in Christ before the foundation of the world with that glory which God, uh, Christ prayed about, okay? Christ had that glory before the foundation of the world. We had that glory before the foundation of the world. Why? Because we're all children of the promise, co-heirs, brethren. Christ the Lord, Christ the Messiah. Let's obey him. All the best. God bless, bless God. Take care.